Greetings and salutations and thank you for clicking on the video. This video is not about Linux, it's about me. If you are one of those who finds that to be inappropriate content for a channel like this, well, I invite you to go look at something else. Justin Bieber videos, whatever, cats, vines, knock yourself out. Those of you who are more mature and more thoughtful might find it interesting to take a little trip down memory lane with me. I was feeling a little bit nostalgic today and started looking at some pictures. I've posted videos like this before, but not recently. And some of you who are new to the channel might find it somewhat interesting. So I invite you to stick around. I'm going to make you look at a slideshow. <laughs> How much fun is that? The picture we're starting out with is me. And I'm about 17 years old here. And this is in the studios of WFOS in Chesapeake which is a radio station that is owned and operated by the city of Chesapeake and it is run by the Chesapeake Public Schools. Those of you who have been around college radio stations, school radio stations, uh, might know that a lot of those are very low power, maybe 10 watts at the most, and some of them have what's called a carrier current system where you can only hear them on campus. WFOS was a bit different. It was a full-powered FM, and it offered a full day's programming. They actually had full-time employees there that would come in and do things like the morning show. And then during school hours, us little snot balls, we would get to take over and push the buttons and play with the radio station. And so there I am doing just that. And it was not necessarily state-of-the-art. This picture is probably from about 1987. Uh, WFOS was sort of a cobbled together sort of place with what we could find, uh, what the engineers could find to use. So the console back there is about a 1978 LPB. We did have some nice turntables though. The turntables you see on the lower left hand side of the picture are Technique's SP25s with Audio Technica tone arms. And I know that we were running Stanton cartridges. 680 SLs to be precise about that and they had the stereohedron styluses on them. The programming for WFOS at this point in time was mostly classical music except for a jazz show in the middle of the day and that's what I did. And then next to the turntables there you see a rack of tape cartridges and you see behind me a bunch of hodgepodge of cart machines for playing those tapes back couple of cassette decks in the rack. There is a CD player up top there. So we weren't completely and totally behind the times, but it didn't get a great deal of use. I have to tell you, most of the programming came from records and tapes back then. And for those of you who have seen modern radio stations, you might notice there are no computers because they weren't there yet. We were doing everything by hand. I still to this day think that that makes for better radio. So it was a fun experience to work there. These are my teachers when I was there. This not so great picture came from a newspaper article scanned in, so that's why it looks the way it does. The fellow on the left is the reason why I open up all my videos with greetings and salutations, because when he was on the radio, he did exactly the same thing. So when I say that, it's a tribute to Dennis McCurdy, and Mr. McCurdy was the teacher that taught me pretty much everything I needed to know about radio programming and radio news. Later in my career, I became a program director and operations manager, and it was amazing to me how much of what that man said to me came back as I was trying to deal with being a program director and all that kind of stuff. The fellow in the middle, that's Dave Dessler. He was the chief engineer at WFOS. He also taught the engineering courses. And he was more than a teacher to me. He was like a second father. And Dave was the one that I worked closest with when I first started the classes there. And because when I first went in, I thought I wanted to be an engineer. I wasn't really too terribly interested about being on air and doing that side of things. But it became pretty apparent that I was not cut out to stick my hand in a transmitter with 50,000 volts in it. It was just something that I wasn't comfortable with, so therefore I moved more toward the on-air side of things. And the fella on the right, that is Jack Garrison. Jack Garrison built WFOS, 
and he was a very interesting man. He was a trombone player with the Billy Butterfield Orchestra back in the 40s and 50s. He was also a recording engineer that worked for Columbia Records for a while, and he had some very colorful stories. He came out of music into radio, and he was the one who built the radio station. He really, he, he, when I say built it, he fabricated a lot of the stuff because it was put together on a shoestring. Now, these days, the studios have been moved. It's mainly automated. There's not a whole lot to it anymore. It's a kind of a hollow shell of what it was when I was going to school there. But do keep in mind that this is 30 years ago. And the thing about being at WFOS was I was able to kind of do college and high school at the same time. I don't know how I wangled this when I was 16 years old, but I went to high school half a day and then jumped into a cab or got on a bus or however I could get from point A to point B, and I would go from Portsmouth, where I lived, to Chesapeake to take the radio classes in the afternoon, and then I would be there till late in the afternoon and come home in the evening. And yeah, during my high school period, I was a real nerd. I didn't have a girlfriend. I wasn't doing a lot of hanging out. I was totally focused on this stuff, but it gave me a jump start. And if you can do it, that's the way to do it. If you're a kid watching this and you can figure out how to do it, go ahead. Learn how to do something that's profitable right out of high school And if you don't want to go through the whole four-year college thing, because that's what I did. Unfortunately, that meant that I didn't get a diploma. I got a certificate. And although I have taken many classes through the years... I still do not have a college diploma, so I kicked myself in the butt about that now 30 years down the road that I probably should have been thinking a little clearer, but it is what it is, you know? While I was at WFOS, I was doing this midday jazz show, and probably the highlight of that experience was getting to meet Dave Brubeck, who is a legendary jazz musician. This picture was taken in 1987, and I interviewed him. I He... I jumped into his limousine and rode around while he did promotional appearances. So this particular picture was taken in front of WHRO-TV on Hampton Boulevard in Norfolk. And so I got a picture with him when I was there. And there it is. And I was nervous. I was nervous as a cat in a room full of rocking chairs with a long tail cat at that time. But was a lot of fun, and I'll never forget it. He turned out to be a very nice man, even though the airline had lost his luggage. This is a picture of me after WFOS. The first job that I had was at WTAR Radio in Norfolk, which they also had an FM station, WLTY. And this is the main production room, production room A. It's a very big room. You can't see it very well in this picture. And I'm sitting there behind the... Harris console, and there's a Techniques SP25 turntable there, and then there in front of me, at the very bottom of the picture, you'll see one of those IBM Ball Rider typewriters, and behind me there, some cart machines, and this is kind of where it all happened. WTAR is the oldest radio station in the state of Virginia. They signed on in 1923, and by the time I had gotten there, she was a old but a uh, gracefully aging lady. And WTAR was the, it was at that point in time, that was for radio, that was the, the main station that you would listen to for news, although we played music. We did a format back then called Full Service, which doesn't exist anymore. And it really, to this day, it's my favorite radio format. And that's where we played music. And we had news and information. We had CBS Radio Network. Uh, there was a lot of things going on on the radio. Had a full news department. Great big newsroom. Had separate news studios. Four or five news cars sitting around the back. You just don't see radio on this, this level. We had a full sports department as well. And so we did, covered a lot of ball games, local games, uh, ODU basketball, Hampton Roads Admirals hockey, lots of stuff like that. So it was, that's kind of was my job when I got there was to ride the board for all of these different sports events. But I did a lot of on-air stuff too. And then later I transferred to the FM and I became the all-night announcer on the FM. 
Here's more pictures from that particular period in time. This might be a little bit later, or actually probably taken the same night that that one was, because I can tell you for sure that these pictures were taken at about one or two in the morning. <laughs> During the day, you couldn't hang out and play around in there. Like It was too busy. There was stuff being done. And the one on the upper left that's me in the little b production studio studio b and there's a picture of my friend george and he is in studio a again and then uh, down there in the lower left i am doing something with a cassette deck that is perched on top of an atari mx5050 open reel machine we had three of those in that studio gotta have three tape recorders if you're going to do crossfades so we actually had the ability to do that which was unusual. Most radio stations had just two per studio, but we had three. It was WTAR. We had to be special. And we did all of the audio production on those tape recorders. We used to do editing with razor blades and tape. That's how we did it. Cut the tape and splice it back together. And then the picture in the lower right-hand corner, the quality is horrible on that. And that's another radio station that I worked at for a short period of time around this period. And I got a friend of mine named Mike Carey sitting behind the board there. So that was just another, that was the competition across town, actually. Mix 105.3 was on at that time. My experience with WTAR was really cool because this was the first place that I actually was exposed to Unix, which, of course, very shortly when these pictures were taken, we would get Linux from that. That computer monitor that you see down here in the lower left-hand corner is part of the mini-frame system that we had in that radio station. That mini-frame system did a lot. It brought in the news from the wire networks, UPI and AP. Also, we had a patch coming from CBS in New York because WTAR at that time was a CBS affiliate. And so we were part of the CBS network. One of the highlights of me working there was feeding stories back to CBS. Every now and again, the, they'd call you from New York and go, do you have any information on this? Can you record an actuality for us? So sometime in 1990, we had some sort of big event happen in town, and I got a call from CBS and had to feed them a news story, and I went out over the entire network. It was kind of awesome. They paid me like 50 bucks for that. Long time ago. But yeah, we had this Linux system, or this Unix system, rather, that took care of everything. And if you worked there, you had an account on it. We had a system administrator who ran the thing. And I probably could have learned a whole lot about it, but at that time, I really didn't care. The only thing I used it for was looking up ball scores. They had, like, a word processor on there, which I believe was Vi. <laughs> so we would go in there, you'd, you'd type something and then print it. And we had printers throughout the building you could choose a network printer so I knew the commands to get that stuff done and that was it but I, I really didn't pay that much attention to it and I worked there from 1989 to late 1993 and then I went somewhere to help a friend put a radio station on the air and then I ended up in the western part of the state in a little town called Rocky Mount Virginia and that was I mean little town 5,000 you may have heard of Rocky Mountain North Carolina most people don't even know there's a Rocky Mountain Virginia but I ended up there somehow working at this radio station and while I was there it was my first introduction to radio automation now this picture is of a Scott studio system and it shows the software that you use to record a radio show and when I got there, they had one of these systems. It wasn't Scott Studios. It was an early system called Systemation. And the guy said, you're going to have to learn how to use this. So I learned computers out of panic. I took the book home for the software, and then I took the book for DOS home and read it. And that's how I got proficient with using these systems. So I worked at that station for actually about three or four years, and then I'm bounced back home to the Hampton Roads area, Norfolk, Portsmouth, Virginia. And the next place that I worked was, uh, in a roundabout fashion, was Intercom Radio in Norfolk. And they owned four radio stations. They still do, and they still own all of them. They're still all there. And this is this main studio at uh, 
two WD WWDE, which is big FM station in this area. This picture was probably taken about 1998, and it shows the computers you see there. The automation system is the great big monitor sitting on top of the bridge across the board there, and that's running Scott Studios. And that particular program you're looking at is called a Troll. That's what we called it back then was a troll. And this was a huge automation system, had these big servers behind it. The whole thing ran on DOS. But by this time, we were actually running them on Windows 98. There was a way that you could throw Windows 98 into DOS mode. So when the computer would boot up, it would immediately jump into DOS and it would start running that system. And then the other computer that you see to the right hand side of the screen there that is a, a Mac which was probably running Mac OS 8 at that time and that's a program on there called Vox Pro that we used for audio editing so people would call in on the phone and we'd record them and use that system and then in the bridge there you see some CD players and then below the monitor you have the transmitter control that's the remote control for the transmitters that was an interesting station to work in because w while I was there, they had moved to this new location on Clearfield Avenue in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And they built these state-of-the-art studios, and it was all computer automated. And the servers were in the rack room. And one day while I was there, the servers just quit working, just stopped. And <laughs> the, we were trying to figure out what was wrong. And we went back there, and the, the, the cat named Shadow, who was the station mascot, had fallen asleep on top of the server, and it overheated. So shut the whole system down, except for the local workstations in the studios. Didn't take, take it off the air, but everything went into emergency mode. These systems were huge, and like I said, I learned a lot about what I know about computers out of panic, because I absolutely had to know how to do it. By the time... This picture was taken, here's another close-up of that board there. By the time that picture was taken, I had become pretty proficient in programming these systems and making them do things. So shortly after this, I got a job as a manager working for a company uh, that I was programming their automation system. I was a program director. And so that shaped the next 10 years of my radio career. There's the rack at 2WD with a bunch of stuff in it. And those of you who have been around radio for a while will notice all the lovely Optimods in there and the old QEI air monitors and stuff. This picture was taken probably around the time that those other two were that we just looked at. I, I'm kind of surprised at how little I actually have from my radio career. I, I think I mentioned that at the beginning of the video, but if I didn't, I've got tons and tons of audio, but very few pictures. My brother says he's got some pictures but um, I haven't seen him yet. So anyway, that's all the stuff in the rack there. And for you radio people that want to ogle it, you can pause the video and look at it. Here's a much later picture of the same radio station. This is long after I was long gone. And these are uh, digital Optimods. And I kind of like the, the machine, the computer there that's laying on its side in the rack. I don't know what it does. <laughs> obviously it does something this picture is probably about three or four years old same radio station I'm still friends with the fellow who's the chief engineer there there named Ernie Warner so every now and again Ernie will post something like this so I moved on from there and I started programming radio stations and uh, ended up in North Carolina working for a group of radio stations there and this is the building that we had our radio stations in and it was probably the most unusual radio studio I'd ever been in actually there's a television station here as well so that the front of the building there where it's two stories the top part of that is a television station you'll notice that the the windows are all blocked off that was the the television studio and that door on the back there this is the back door to the building uh, that's where the master control was for television so the studio was upstairs, master control was downstairs, and the front of the building, which you can't see in this particular shot uh, downstairs, that was the lobby in the head office. And then as you walk back through, the studios were in the back half of that, uh, the lower part of the building there, and the 
where the satellite dish is next to that window. That is my office. So, very interesting. We had six radio stations and a television station in this building. And the railroad tracks behind there, they were actually in use. So, those of you who know anything about railroads, this is where the Portsmouth Division of the CSX Railroad begins. So I thought it was kind of ironic that I would end up working in a building that was on the other end of the Portsmouth Division because where I grew up is uh, the beginning. So this is the end here and the beginning, depending on which direction you go, is the beginning or the end. This is the, uh, the other end of that particular rail line and I was on the other end of it. So uh, the, one of the downsides to being there was is that you would go into a studio and a train would go by and it would shake everything. <laughs> And we had the studios, they were built, they were rooms within a room. They were built uh, very well and they were soundproof, but it's used, it would shake. The, the room would actually shake when the train went by. Uh, so this is one of my last radio jobs. Here's a picture of me there. Uh, I was the operations manager. I'm in the back and the lady on the right is, or rather the lady on the left is Donna Fox and the fellow on the right was Johnny Draper. Johnny Draper was our midday personality there. Donna was mornings and I was afternoons and Johnny was middays and then we had the Tom Kent Coast to Coast show on at night and that was our little radio station there and this was a proof that was sent to me by the newspaper. I was buying an ad in the newspaper and this is what it looked like and they got the names. They, they If you notice down here, I don't know how well you can see it, especially if YouTube's putting a banner up or something. But down here it says Donna Fox, Johnny Draper, and Joe Collins. So I had to have them correct that, but I kept the proof. And that's what ended up running in the newspaper. WTRG, which I have plenty of audio from. If you want to hear what I sounded like on WTRG, you can go back through the old videos. I got tons of audio from my radio days up there. So when I was at WTRG, we used a system called Media Touch. And by now, I am really good at this. Uh, before I took the job at 2WD, I forgot to mention, I had a very short period of time where I worked for Gateway Computer in Hampton. And while I was there, I got a couple of certificates. I got a TSP, which is a technical support professional, and then the uh, Microsoft Certified Engineer, MCSC, I think that's what that's called. I've lost those in moves. I can't show you the paper, but I did take the class. So this helped me in my radio career because when I went back to work in radio after the Gateway thing, I got burned out on it real fast. Uh, they saw that I had that, so I ended up being the IT guy. I was the local IT guy, and plus I could, being in programming and being able to actually program these systems. When I say programming, I'm talking about programming the show on the radio, but I also could program the automation system which was part of the job. And then I had enough computer savvy at that point to be able to maintain the systems. And while I was working there, I actually worked very closely with uh, the folks who create Media Touch and contributed a lot of stuff to that particular program. I'm not going to get into how programming automation systems work because it's really rather tedious. You just create this really long list of commands. Everything that the machine does is it's a robot but it only does what you tell it so it never thinks for itself so for a day's worth of programming on the radio you have to create all of this uh, you have to create a uh, what's known as a log for that thing to run through which is just a, basically a long text file with one command after another you know play this song turn this on turn this off that sort of thing and we had all kinds of support software that did that you didn't have to build that big long thing every day we had music schedulers we had schedulers that uh, automatically scheduled commercials and we'd take and merge all that together and put it into one log that was my main job was ride and herd on these systems so this is a system that we put in at one of the stations that I was in charge of not in the same building that I just showed you a little while back uh, this was in another building in another town this is uh, WDLZ in a Hosky, North Carolina and they rebuilt the studios there and we put in the system. So the monitor on the left is running the, uh, what is that, Adobe Audition? Yeah, that was the audio editor we were using. The middle part runs the station and over on the right hand side of the screen, that's the production software where you actually record audio into the system or import it, drag and drop, whatever the deal is. So this picture 
this particular picture was probably from about 2007. It's after I left. A friend of mine sent it to me, but it's the best picture I've seen of showing the system together. And at that point in time, they were all HP computers that it was running on. They just replaced all of that not too long ago, I've been told. So I left there, and then I moved on to WSIG and WBOP in Harrisonburg, Virginia. This is my friend Fritz Horsk. He still works there, man. I've been gone for years. <laughs> Don't work there no more. But Fritz is still there, man. Uh, so this is the last radio job that I had before I was bounced out of the industry. They had a management restructuring there, and they essentially fired the entire management. So it wasn't that I was a horrible program director or whatever the deal was. It was just that they restructured the company. And I just never was able to get another job back in radio that suited me. The business, you know, that big economic crash they had in 2008 just sort of killed the radio business. It's not the same as it used to be. And they don't pay the money that they used to pay. And they have... Uh, most of the time, you walk into a radio station, and we, ha you know, you've got two or three people trying to run two or three radio stations. It's a headache. It's just, it's a pressure cooker type job. And even though I would still enjoy working with the software and the computers that make radio do what it does, I'm not a big fan of automated radio. So it's kind of a catch-22 for me to be in because I'm sitting there going, well, on the one hand, I like the technology part of it, but on the other. I don't think a radio station without people is much of a radio station. It certainly isn't very relevant. So I could go on and on about that. But here's Fritz, and he's sitting at the board at WSIG. And we had an automation system there called Maestro. And at that particular point in time, it was owned by Google. And I worked with Google very closely and beta tested a lot of Maestro improvements with them. I had a deal where they were helping me to improve the system locally. This was also the company that I worked at where I was there for about, I don't know, I was there for about a month and uh, had a server crash and lost every bit of data we had almost. Fortunately, I was able to reconstruct a lot of that data, but that was one heck of an experience because I'd only been there about a month or two and I said, okay, where's the backups? And they all looked at me and said, what backups? I went, you haven't been backing any of this stuff up. It was a mess took me about six months to recover from that and I completely rebuilt that system and started working with the programmers directly to get things in there that I needed and about the time I got everything working and everything was moving along and we were doing good job I felt like things were getting better is when they called me in the office and fired me and I went okay fine all right <laughs> you know uh, so after that I kinda went through a period where I did a lot of things I started an insurance agency for a while that didn't work and did freelance audio production and voiceover work. Yeah, There's a lot of people doing that. A lot of folks out of the radio industry, so I couldn't keep up with the competition. However, my demo is still on YouTube if you want to go look at it. It's still on this channel. You can listen to my demo. Did that for a while and kind of got to a place where uh, I just kind of gave up on trying to be in broadcasting. The, the industry had changed so much that it was just not a place I wanted to be. So I ended up doing some YouTube videos early on. If you go back to the very early days of this channel, you will see that most of my videos are about old tape decks because at that time I was going through a midlife crisis and I thought it was really cool to uh, rebuild these old tape decks that I couldn't afford when I was a kid. I always had a thing for cassette decks, so I rebuilt about 30 of them and did videos on a lot of them. And that's where that started. So I was talking about turntables and tape decks and things like that. And then, I guess a couple of years ago, I started talking about Linux, and it took off. So that's where we are and how we got to where we are today. Uh, this is a very good friend of mine, Laurent Bert Roussel, who is a, now a retired airplane pilot. I met him through the videos that I used to post about audio. I used to do a, a blog called JC's Audio File, like a vlog. And so... There I am doing that. A lot of people ask me why I stopped doing the videos about audio. Well, there was a couple of things that happened that made it where I just sort of uh, lost interest in it. The first thing was is that YouTube changed the way that content providers who participate in the monetization program get paid. And I lost a lot of income 
at that point in time. And what I used to do is I'd get enough from YouTube where I could buy some sort of little piece of audio equipment, a phono cartridge or whatever, and I could talk about that. And then that just stopped. I couldn't do it anymore. And the other thing was is that I, I think I'd kind of covered all the ground I wanted to cover. So what I decided to do was kind of let YouTube go for a while, and I started a group on Facebook called JC's Phono Works. And a lot of the people who used to watch me do the YouTube videos are there, and we talk about audio-related stuff there. It's not a big deal to me today. I don't do as much with it because the Linux thing just took off. Uh, when I started posting about Linux, uh, uh, when I made the switch a couple of years ago, people really responded to the videos. And I wanted to reach out to the community. And so what I did was uh, I went and took a class where I uh, took the Linux Foundation certification class. Now, I haven't gotten the certification yet. I took the class, and I've taken several other classes, and I've read a lot of books and stuff like that. But I haven't just actually gone for the cert yet because they want, like, $350 for you to be able to take the test. <laughs> I was like, I ain't got that kind of cash to cough up on that yet. Sometime I'm going to do that. I want to get a sysadmin cert. But I wanted to make sure that I knew what I was talking about before I posted the videos and started offering to help people with Linux. Here's another picture of my one of my audio vids being played on TV. And uh, so anyway, I, I just wanted to learn more about the system. And so therefore, that's how we got to where we are today. This is what I do. So I take a lot of the things that I learned in broadcasting. Most of my time in radio was on radio, but in I've done a little TV through the years, so I can bring a lot of that stuff into these videos and the communication part of it. And it's one of the reasons that I make the longer videos because my experience is, is that if you're going to do any sort of a, a broadcast kind of thing and you're going to talk about things uh, that have detail to them, you need to take time and talk to people. And short little videos that don't really show you a whole lot or don't tell you a whole lot they don't help a lot of people and so that's why we have the format that we have so generally what I do with my videos is every one of us 20 to 30 minutes long and we just sit and talk about something for a while and just ramble on about it and I try and get into as much detail as I possibly can I'm not perfect I leave things out and I suffer from dyslexia so I get stuff backwards all the time and say the wrong thing and whatever the deal is but hey it's it is what it is and a lot of people over the last couple three years have come to me and said how much of a help the videos were so it's definitely been worthwhile to do this and it takes the best of what I learned in broadcasting and it brings it forward to today so we went from this to this ladies and gentlemen of course nowadays I don't put my face on the screen very often I don't use webcams I do mostly screencasts like this one and I just I don't know you know what I mean it's much easier if I don't have to look at a camera I can move around and be myself like in a radio station one of the greatest things I loved about radio was you could be standing there you know scratching your head or whatever the deal is and nobody would be able to see you as long as it sounded okay it's fine you could do whatever you want to do so thank you for watching this video and taking a trip down memory lane. Check out Easy Linux on Facebook. Check out Easy Linux on the web. And check out Freedom Penguin for lots of great stories about Linux. And if you're interested about my radio stuff, all you got to do is go to the channel. And I have tons and tons of old radio stuff posted me on the radio. And I also have... Uh, some of the people that I looked up to and worked with, they're posted here as well. So do check that out if you're interested. Thanks for watching.